Imagine this. You and a smart robot are both before a fair and smart judge who cannot see you. The judge has to pick which of you it thinks is human. The one it thinks is human gets to live. The other one dies. And of course, you both want to live. The catch? You only get one word to convince them. So what do you choose? This is the basis of something called the minimal Turing test. And if you want to play along, pause the video and come up with your word. Then I'll explain why you probably chose it and what better word you could have chosen if your life depended on it. In the original study, 936 people were asked this question and they produced 428 unique words later clustered into 10 main categories. I think it's remarkable that there's such a wide spread in responses here. But how did we settle on such different answers? There are so many different ways that you could approach this problem, but a lot of them produce really bad results because they rely on faulty assumptions. I'm gonna to try to explain that here. Most of us, I think, would start by trying to demonstrate our humanity. Whatever that spark is that makes you you. This is where we get the first cluster of responses from this study, aptly named self and identity. These were things like human, self, love, and soul. Humanity was also there, I think. But if the buck stops here, we don't have enough reasoning to set us apart from robots. Robots could definitely come up with these words as well, which is why this first cluster fails. So we know we need to be a little bit more clever. Not only do we have to pick something that a machine isn't also going to choose, but we need to pick a word that a judge is going to understand, right? We're not just trying to prove our humanity. We also need to outsmart the machine and pick something that is convincing to someone else. So how do we do this? The paper elucidates this a bit further. In choosing a word, you likely reflected on some of the salient differences between humans and machines. But if they're salient, if they're obvious to you, they'd probably also be pretty obvious to a clever enough machine. So they wouldn't make good choices here. Now, I think we're missing some vital information here, something a bit more meta. We have to make some assumptions about the judge. We know that they're fair and smart, but we don't know that they're human. Do you think this would affect your answer? Because I certainly think it would affect mine. I think if I'm trying to convince another human, I'm going to try to appeal to their empathy, whereas I might not do the same with a robot. I think this instinct points at something important. If you don't think a robot can feel fear, maybe you should try to show it. If your life is at stake, I think you probably should sound frantic and alive and more than a little desperate. I think this is probably what some of the people in the next clusters attempted. In the life and death cluster, we have words like pain and alive. And in the faith and spirituality cluster, we have words like hope and God and mercy. I would assume that most of the people in these two clusters just thought that pain, for example, was endemic to the human condition. But I think there are quite a few people, at least, who took this seriously. Now, I don't think this type of person is in the majority of the people who responded in this category. I think there are probably plenty of people who just think that things like pain are endemic to the human condition. But I think there are at least a few people who really took this scenario seriously, who weren't just answering. I think they were pleading. The study doesn't actually address the difference between human and robot judges, but in this case, they were actually using human subjects as they were in the original Turing test. So assuming we can appeal to their humanity, what psychology can we exploit? I think the direction you take is actually a lot more interesting knowing that we're appealing to a human and not a robot, because I think it says a lot more about what you think distinguishes humans and machines on a few different levels. At the first level, we can assume that the judge has certain mental capacities. This is called mind perception, and it's how we infer that other sentient creatures, namely humans, have thoughts and feelings. We attribute certain capacities to them. 
things like beliefs or intentionality or the ability to plan for the future, for example. And we interact with them based on these assumptions. I think this explains the fourth cluster, mind and agency, which has words like decision and judgment. We attribute the capacity to make judgment calls and to make decisions to the other mind. Simultaneously, we're operating under what the researchers call the Rational Speech Act framework. You might not agree with me on this, but I sort of operate under the assumption that language is a technology for cooperating and for interaction in general. I think the whole point is to be heard and understood so that you can collaborate on things together. You can act in accordance with one another. You don't just speak, you predict how others will interpret the words that you're saying and what they'll do with that information. You do this all the time. Like when you make an inside joke with a friend who just gets it, you're relying on shared meaning. When you pick your word, you're also guessing at how the judge will interpret it. You are also relying on shared meaning. You're trying to predict the mind behind the question. In doing that, you also reveal your assumptions about what a human isn't. Maybe you think robots are cold and unfeeling and efficient. So in trying to combat that, you swing to the opposite side and you pick something like warm. Even though warm isn't the most accurate description of what a human is. I think this line of reasoning is what leads to our fifth cluster, which is emotion and affect. When people use words like love and compassion and empathy, they're not just trying to signal to a judge that they know what these words are or what they represent, right? We're presupposing that a judge is going to understand that we are capable of feeling these things. We're simultaneously trying to show that not only do we understand that these feelings are fundamental to guiding the human experience, but also that a robot wouldn't understand the profundity of these experiences and therefore wouldn't rationally choose one of these words as its answer. We're trying to signal that we feel, that we bleed meaning into the universe in ways that logic can't replicate. And yet we're still missing something here. We could think of this in even broader terms and then chisel down into something more useful. The authors of the study point out something fascinating to me and then just sort of leave it unexplored in the beginning of their paper. But I wanna draw your attention to it. This test doesn't have to be about humans versus robots. You could reframe it entirely. What one word would you use to convince someone that you were a man or a woman? Maybe that you're a grandparent. What would you say to convince someone that you're American or British? We intuitively reason about groups, about the differences between us. And in doing so, we rely on stereotypes, whether explicit or implicit. We even hold meta stereotypes, which are beliefs about the stereotypes that other people hold. So your one word is no longer just about you. It's about who you think they think you are. Does pointing this out help us here? I think so. Let's take the man-woman example, for instance. If I have to convince a judge that I'm a woman, I'm probably going to approach the problem very similarly to how I'm approaching the human problem now, trying to figure out what that experience feels like to me. But if I have to convince someone that I'm a man, I can't rely on my own experiences anymore. So what stereotypes am I invoking? I really think this immediately changes the way that we look at the problem. On the one hand, I can draw directly from my own experience of being a woman. I can embody the feelings associated with it. But to convince them that I'm a man, I'd have to switch into a more observational state, something performative and strategic and rational. I think this gives us insight. We know the judge is fair and smart, and will probably understand this distinction between embodiment and observation. And that shift from lived feeling to a rational mimicry might be what distinguishes the human from the machine. 
How does embodiment fit into the overall framework? People judge minds along two dimensions, agency and experience. Agency is thinking and planning and doing. It's things like decision-making and self-control and morality. Experience is feeling. It's pain and hunger and sorrow and jealousy. Humans are seen to be high in both. Animals, on the other hand, are generally seen to be high in experience, but low in agency. They're clearly capable of suffering, but perhaps not capable of planning for tax season. Funnily enough, I think this actually explains cluster six, which is animals and non-humans. People would say words like dog, probably because there's something about the experience of pet ownership that captures something deeply human. There's something about the companionship the capacity for loyalty, this care that we have for dogs and other pets that isn't based on being able to understand them or even relate to them, but just on pure love. To this point, robots are seen as the exact opposite of animals. They are high in agency, but low in experience. We actually get uneasy when robots have too much experience, right? They should be able to plan and to rationalize, but they shouldn't be able to feel. We're very uncomfortable with the thought of a robot truly feeling. It crosses a bit of a sacred line for us. Ergo, clusters seven and eight. We have body and sensation, which is things like heartbeat or skin. And we have food and appetite, so things like pizza or banana. A robot wouldn't understand the experience of feeling your own heart beating or of feeling anything physically. And I don't think a robot would value the importance of food or satiety nearly as much as the human would. They just wouldn't understand it. It makes sense that people would disproportionately answer in this way. Starvation was a real threat to survival for most people who have ever lived. I'm sure some of the people who responded in the study were hungry when they gave their answers. So food was probably top of mind for them. They felt those sensations in their body and it guided the way they answered this question, right? Sensation is aliveness. So if you're disturbed by the thought of a robot having feelings, maybe you lean into that. Maybe you choose a word that's high in experience, but maybe sacrifices on agency because that marks us as different. Words like grief and loneliness, yearning, desire, waiting, home. These words bleed with emotion, but they don't act. They just sort of sit and suffer and feel. There's still a problem with this line of thinking. A robot could still pick these words. They could say, lonely, or waiting, or home. They signal experience. They sound like they're feeling. And they have the right syntax. They're using all the right words. But we'd still know. When an AI says, I feel lonely, we don't believe it. Not because the grammar is wrong, the words are correct, but because it lacks texture it lacks that anchored, embodied reference point. Loneliness for a machine is an association of tokens. It's a word vector. But in humans, it's that hollow feeling that's somehow really heavy. It's that pressure that feels like it's gonna burst you wide open, right? And ironically, the people who overthink their word, who intellectualize it, end up sounding robotic themselves. In that distance between thought and feeling, something vital gets lost. So, 428 different words from 936 people distilled down into 10 clusters. The first eight that we talked about were tried by the vast majority of respondents. Experience-rich words dominated here. We signal humanness through feeling far more than through doing. Love 
was by far the most common response. But there are still two categories we haven't discussed yet. And when paired against all the other words, they came out as seeming more human most consistently. So what are they? What are we missing? Can you guess? You know those memes about how AI could never come up with this? That's all I could think about when I was reading these responses. These are unmistakably human. It's fascinating. We like to authenticate our humanity by signaling emotion and experience. But the words that performed best, the ones that humans thought were most likely to be generated by other humans, the ones that caught people off guard, they're funny and taboo and a little messy. It makes sense, doesn't it? We are imperfect and strange. Our humor lives right beside our fear. Things like a typo in an email are believable, right? Laughing in a very serious moment is awkward, but it's authentically human. A word like poop in a life or death scenario is, yes, a human universal, but it's also just so absurd, and thus it feels unmistakably alive. It's this authentic signal of consciousness. The truly human response isn't going to be neatly packaged or perfectly rationalized or like optimized for performance or elegant. It's visceral. I want to share what I came up with. Before I dug into all the research, before I started making this video, before I walked down all these different lines of thinking. And my answer then was trying. I want to share it because I think this is what defines us. This restless pursuit of something better. That ache of effort. Robots execute, right? But we try and we fail and we try again. But even though I like my answer, and I think it is authentically human. I do think I would have to switch to poop and answer with that. Because maybe if being human means anything at all, it's that we can hold both sincerity and silliness in the same breath. We can talk about meaning and still laugh at the absurd. If you're still watching, thank you. I would love to hear the word you chose, if it's changed after watching this video, and what you think it says about the kind of human that you are. Thanks again. Take care.